Welcome to Two Cents FC. I'm your host, Amobi Okugo, back again with my guy, L. Happy New Year's. Uh, hopefully, many blessings into 2022. Each week, this show will be talking with individuals from around the soccer world, learning about their stories and getting their unfiltered thoughts and opinions. This week, we're joined by Columbus Crew baller, young legend, Marlon Hairston. And uh, we'll be getting to know all about Marlon, talking about his playing career and learning about some of his off-pitch endeavors. Marlon, how are you doing today? What's good, y'all? Thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, just made it back to Columbus, Ohio uh, a few days ago, and you know, I'm excited to get the season underway. Perfect, perfect. Any predictions? Any predictions you're willing to share before we get started? Ooh. Uh, I mean, last year it was good to be a... Uh, it was, last year was my first time actually winning a trophy since I've been in the league. Uh, so we, we, we uh, won, what was it, Capionis Cup? Um, Amazing. You know, that was huge for me uh, to finally be able to win something. Uh, but, you know, this year, you know, we, we still have bigger uh, aspirations and, you know, making playoffs is, is a minimum. But uh, hopefully we're able to add, add some more uh, hardware to the trophy case. No, most definitely. You know, you had a great season. Uh, I wouldn't say breakout season because you've been uh, you've been a, a top player for so many years. But uh, to see you and Nagby in the midfield and I'm excited to see what you guys do uh, next year. I, I'm going over five assists for you this year. Um, I think you're going to play a little bit of right back as well um, after how awful left, but we'll see. I'm not Caleb Porter. I'm not the coach. Right. Let's get started. Uh, uh, L, what you got? We got the two truths and a cap. Yeah, for sure. So um, one thing we like to do when we kick off a show is play a quick game of two truths and a cap. So it's a quick little icebreaker game um, to help us get to know you. Um, so you tell us three facts about yourself. Two will be true. One will be a lie. And Moby and I have to guess what the lie is. So um, if you listen to the show, you know that I'm up up big probably. It's a new narrative. year. New year. We start zero zero. All right. All right. All right. I, I'll take that. All right. New year. Yeah. Zero zero. Um, now we can actually keep track. <laughs> all right, for sure. All right. So Marlon, whenever you're ready, man, go ahead. All right. Uh, two truths and a cap. Uh, all right. So the first one I would say. Uh, I meal prep uh, at least once a week. Uh, the second one would be I once competed in a regional spelling bee. And then the third one would be uh, a big LeBron fan. So we'll, we'll see what y'all can figure out. Okay, yeah, those are good. Those are good. Uh, nah, Columbus, y'all probably get your meals taken care of. So okay. what would you be meal prepping that like once a week? Nah, spelling bee. I could see that. Uh, you went to, you went to Louisville, right? Yeah, I went to Louisville. Not to, not to say like whichever school you went to makes you like smarter what? or not, but, uh, <laughs> Nah, I don't think you're a LeBron fan. That's my. I think that's the cap. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, you are related to some someone that's in the NBA. I, I think I remember that as like a fun fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was hoping you were gonna use that, but yeah, I thought about uh, that. I said that would be easy. They probably might have known that one. Side. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think you're a LeBron fan. I think you're like Kobe and like like you know. Yeah, I might go with that one too. Someone against the green. Okay, y'all both just not a LeBron fan. Yeah, I think that's uh, a cap. Nah, the so the the cap was the was the bill, but like I, I never I'm never in the kitchen for real. Every now uh -huh. and then, every now and then I might do a little something on the grill, uh, but I don't really cook too much. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. I when I was like 14 or something, I went to like this regional spelling bee. I guess like somebody in my class won, but they couldn't go, so they just uh -huh. volunteered. Like anybody else want to go? I was like, man, why not? Like. I'll do it. <laughs> and it was actually in Atlanta. So I went down there. I went on stage. And my first word they gave me, boom, I'm done. My time was over. Like, <laughs> cool experience. Uh, you got a trip out of it. I made it, you know what I mean? So it was fun, though. And then, yeah, Brian, yeah, Brian's like, you know, one of my idols for real. For real, for real. I just, I respect everything he's done, you know, his his path to, you know, to, to the point he's at now, being from a small town in Akron, me being from a small city of Jackson, uh, 
you know, I just, I just, everything that he's done for himself and, you know, the career he's made for himself, I just, you know, I commend it. And, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big Ron fan for real. No, I respect that. Well, uh, if you ever need help looking for like a meal subscription delivery service partnership, Small I'm lights. sure Elk can, I'm sure Elk can help uh, help uh, facilitate some of that those brand partnerships. Okay, you know, yeah, definitely plug. Blue Blue Apron, Hello Fresh, Trifecta, <laughs> what what you need? We we oh, got you on that. Yeah, we'll get you on that, yeah, like, you know, you on that small Fresh thing a few years ago when COVID first hit. And then I just couldn't do it, man. I was, I was after a week. I was like, I'm done. I can't do it. Yeah. yeah, one of those is like it's like too much prep, too much prep work. Yeah. I forget which one it is. Yeah, like, that was cool though. It was, it was yeah. a good experience, I guess, but not for me. I know one yeah, thing. I, for- I, I need to I need to not follow you, Amobi, when it comes to these answers because I was thinking the meal prep <laughs> thing, especially when you especially when you said Columbus Crew takes care of meals. Mm-hmm. I was like, that makes sense. Right. I, right. I should I should have stuck with that, but. Nah, look at me but, you know, he's from like he's from the south, so I was like, you know, everyone right. knows how to cook on the grill. So I was like, you know, right, right. Hey, but if you need help too from the right price, I get you on my small chops meal delivery service plan. Okay, I like bet, to cook. Bet. I might need that. <laughs> get that good Nigerian food. Dude. <laughs> but yeah, let's get right into it. Uh, obviously, you know, you you mentioned you came from a small city. Right. Uh, when did you fall in love with soccer? Man, I think I got my first soccer ball when I was like three years old uh, for Christmas or something. And, man, it was just something that I would just, you know, go around the house kicking this little ball around. But uh, I kind of just followed into my brother's footsteps. Uh, he, he was playing. Uh, he's about six years older than I am. So I would just go to his games and watch him. And, you know, I saw how passionate he would, he ended up being, you know, about the sport. But for me, you know, it was just something else to do. Like I was playing basketball. Um, middle school, I played a little football, but um, I say the older I got, um, the more passionate I became uh, of the sport and mm-hmm. something that, that's kind of stuck with me. No, that's amazing. So how was it for you, you know, you know, being in the South where, you know, everyone else is playing other sports? Um, it's not as prevalent in terms of like, you know, if you're in other cities, you see a lot of people playing the sport. How were you guys able to stay so focused and like stay in the sport as you guys got older? Yeah, man, that's a good question because um, growing up, I was juggling. Like I said, I was juggling a few sports. Uh, and I think the turning point for me, like, uh, I was playing a little football. Football was never really my thing. Like, it was just something else cool to do, you know, the pep rallies in school. Um, and just being able to, like, I don't know, like, I like to, like, look swaggy on the field. Like, you know what I mean? So with the, the sun visor and all that, like, the gloves, yeah. I just thought it was cool. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right, let me try this. Um Definitely wasn't for me, um, but I really, really liked basketball, and it just came down to when I got into high school, uh, the coach that I had at the time was like, yo, I had cornrows, and he was like, yo, like, you got to cut the braids off if you want to, you know what I mean, if you want to play on the team, so for that, it was like, my hair was who I was at the time, uh, so it's was like, nah, like, this is a big part of who I am, so I can't do that, so I, like, that was the reason why I let go of basketball and just really, like, focused on soccer. Wow, that's a crazy story. And uh, I appreciate you sharing that because there's been like, you know, every now and then you see like articles like um, young student has to cut off his braids or something like that. Or you didn't make the team because of how he was uh, present- presented, which is crazy when you think about it. How do you think we should keep like the culture or keep who we are and not conform in the sport of soccer? Because um, we see that a lot. Obviously, in your situation, it was basketball, but in soccer, we see that. How do you like? What are some ways that we can keep who we are and the culture in the game? Yeah, I think culture is definitely a big part of uh, of it. And for me, it's about when I step on the field, I, I like to look good. You know, if I feel like I look good, and I feel like that that you know portrays to how I play. Uh, and back then, shout out, shout out, Deion Sanders, right, look good, feel right. good, play good. <laughs> yeah, shout out to him, man. Uh, but yeah, that was a big, a big part of me uh, when I had the hair uh, back then. So I was a big Allen Iverson fan. Also, when he was rocking the braids, I was playing basketball, so I was like trying to get the designs of my hair like that. You know, having like the little sleeves like he was like. So I was all about that. You know what I mean? And uh, and not, not just basketball, like soccer also, like now seeing like guys like Pogba and seeing, you know, how they're able to like do things like that on the field with, 
you know, whether it might be the hair, you know, him putting like little initials in his hair or the color, you know, whatever it might be, like I, I'm all for it. And, uh, you know, once I got in the league, I had long dreads and, you know, that was, that became a big part of my, my young career coming into the league because maybe people didn't know my name, but they recognized me by my hair. And, you know, for me, it was just another way where I could try to market myself and, you know, try to keep, keep my name, um, relevant without having a name, you know what I mean? My face. So, um, yeah, I had long dress for a while and, uh, you know, ultimately I just, you know, end up cutting them off cause they got a little, a little too long and too heavy. Um, yeah, but definitely, definitely, uh, was a big part of me. Yeah. Both of you and your brother had locks. Is there like a meaning or a story behind like you guys' lock journey? Mm, well, I think, uh, for me, I never really wanted dreads. Uh, that was his thing. Uh, but some braids was just my thing. And then up until like my junior year of high school, I uh, was rocking was rocking braids. And I ended up having the opportunity to go to IMG. But I was like, well, if I go to IMG and play, like uh, maybe I want to find somebody that can do my braids all the time down there. Like, But if, if I can do dreads, like I, I can learn how to do my own dreads in the house, you know what I mean? So I was like, yeah. all right, well, I'm going to just try to lock my hair up. And that's what, that was why I did it initially um, for that reason there. Okay. Oh. Uh, that's, yeah, that's dope. That's a dope story. I had no idea you went to IMG. So uh, yeah. give us like the uh, like origin story. Obviously, you grew up, you know, following your brother's footsteps, you know, where you guys are from. Not a lot of people, you know, make it out in terms of playing soccer but right. that 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 gap that that generation between you and your brother had quite a few people um that made it um talk about your upbringing you know from club soccer to img to you know eventually going to college and then eventually going pro yeah i mean i just remember when i was younger uh going on these trips with my brother's teams and watching them play and we grew up playing in a small club called uh, central jackson soccer organization um we had a few few boys teams, maybe one or two girls teams, but it wasn't a big club. Uh, but everything we did was, you know, for the community or um, things that we were able to do came from the community. So if we wanted to go to tournaments or get uniforms, we would do like little like uh, car washes or we would do like uh, yard sales. Or we just you know what I mean, do things like that to raise money so that we could try to fund ourselves to go to these tournaments and do things like that. Um, but we were all like very, very close. Like my family was close with probably friends with all of my teammates, uh, family, you know, like that. So, uh, we, I still have good relationships with, you know, all of those guys to this day. And, um, you know, we would just, sometimes if my family couldn't travel with me on the weekend, I would ride with the next guy's family, or maybe we just run out of bus and maybe two families travel and just send the players there. And so it was things like that where we were able to make it work with what we had and, over time, we just, we became better and better and better, like players. And, you know, uh, so it started from us just having something else to do uh, to keep kids, you know, out of the streets and, you know, keep us doing something that was positive uh, to us actually getting players to go uh, to college and getting scholarships and stuff like that. And, and now, fortunately for me, to actually make a career out of this. No, nah, most definitely. Was it a case of like, you know, just the top talent together at all times and pushing each other? Or was there like a certain aspect of your development that you focused on for you to, you know, make it to where you are now? Yeah, i say like uh, on my team growing up, it got to the point where we, we had like super, super athletes, like guys that could play basketball, guys that could play football. Like we were just like super athletic. And uh, we didn't really know much about soccer, but um, as we got older, time 12, 13, we became like better with the coaches that we had moved to Mississippi, from, like Trinidad, from Cuba, um, that actually was like teaching us the game. And we were actually like starting to learn more and more. And, um, yeah, but like when you put, you know, knowledge of something with, you know, guys that are just pure athletes, you know, um, we were able to try to make something out of it. And like I said, just the more we st stuck with it and, um, kept going to big, big tournaments and stuff like that. And, you know, we're like, all right, well, if we go into these big tournaments, we have to be able to try to compete with them or else we're just going to get blown out every game. And I think uh, just our competitive spirit and, you know, um, us wanting to try to win and, you know what I mean, 
it, it, it helped us and it, it made a big part in our success. No, I love that. I love that you said that too, because sometimes you see like soccer pundits and people on uh, Twitter will say, if our best athletes played soccer, right. uh, you talked about how, you know, you guys were able to be multi-sport athletes, you know, play basketball, football, right. uh, track, whatever it may be. And, but the key component was you guys developed at a young age about the knowledge and the tactical ability. So where do you stand on that quote? And um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that was huge for me. Um, and I think if I would have even learned that, you know, even earlier that, um, you know, I think about what my career could could be or could have been, um, you know, because um, a lot of things that I was learning growing up, I was learning from watching the sport or watching my brother, you know, I mean, watching um, games on TV and stuff like that. Um, but actually like having like structure and things like that didn't come about until I kind of got 16, 17, 18, you know? So, you know, for me, it was like, wow, it was, it was an eye opener for me because I didn't, I didn't view the game in that, in that same eye, but um, it's just, you know, I was kind of trying to play catch up to guys that are already, you know, been taught that and, you know, already knew about those, you know, skills, uh, tactics, things like that. Um, for me, it was just, First, growing up, being pretty good, but also being athletic enough to, you know, to hide the things that I wasn't great at, uh, to actually learning more and more about the game and, you know, trying to play catch up to guys that, you know, were, were ahead of me already. No, I appreciate that answer. And then uh, to follow up, you know, you talked about, you know, being in the South. If you had like, uh, let me say, Buku money and you Perfect. came – to try to change the landscape of U.S. soccer. How would you change, you know, growing the game in the urban community? Like, you know, where we grow up, you know, you know, keeping more people that look like us in the sport. Like, what, what's your method to, uh, you know, grow it? Uh, that's a great question because for me, like, um, we didn't have, in Mississippi, we didn't have the luxury uh, of academies there. So uh, I didn't get that experience until I left and went to IMG. And um, now when I go home in off season, I, I'm able to like go and see kids that that's now they're trying to play soccer or learn in the game or, you know, they're interested in it now uh, because back then soccer wasn't a thing. Uh, but now seeing that it's like, you know, maybe we need more pitches down there, uh, more, I, I, I hate this pay to play thing that US soccer had. Um Hey, speak on it. Yeah. We got time for this. Yeah, man, I hate that because uh for me it just seems that you know, a lot of the best talent, you know, uh, they they're not able to afford it or they're not given that luxury. Um and for me and for my family, I know it was you know, like, like I was saying, we were having a carpool and do these things to try to raise money to go into, you know, these tournaments and take make these trips and for my parents to be able to do this for me and for my brother also, you know, now looking back, it's like, wow, they really put not just time, but money, you know what I mean? And, um, so I give them as much credit, uh, to, to my success as anybody else, uh, because, uh, they really made a lot of sacrifices, but definitely pay to play thing. And, you know, when I go back home now, it's like, when I want to go work out and train, sometimes I'm hopping fists to like go on the field to play, you know what I mean? And I just feel like, now we shouldn't be having to do this in you know 2022. Uh, yo, I, I'm so glad you said that, and I don't really want to go on a rant right now. But the fact that you have to hop Going fences, to yeah, man, it's the crazy. fact that you have to hop fences, like this is a situation where you have someone that's made it out. You've played over eight years in the league, yeah. you know, over two, uh, over 100 games, 100 starts. Um, you would think that they're trying to find ways to highlight that, right. like. Yo, this guy came from this club, came from this city. You know, if you want to follow in his footsteps, you know, to avoid some of the situations that a lot of young individuals that, you know, find themselves in trouble, right. you know, look at him as a role model. Right. You know, this is someone that comes back every off season, mm -hmm. comes and trains, you know, it helps mentor the young guys along with you and your brother and some of the other guys that are, are playing at a high level. Mm -hmm. And it, the fact that you got a hot fence is like, there's not one field that like, yo, come in, you guys could use the field. And all I ask is that you guys um, share, like you guys are using this facility or, you know, you let 
the young guys come and watch you guys. That's just simple. That's right. like one step in, in right. how you guys can, you know, build it. So I'm, I'm in charge of like putting the pickup together in, uh, in Northern okay. California. Okay. So I was able to get, you know, all the sad guys today, all the Bay guys, and then people from, you know, a little bit farther. And we were using a field just trying to like Davis legacy field. So I'm, I was going to blast them on Twitter, but I was just doing it on the podcast. So we using the field and like, don't get me wrong. Davis does a great job developing some of the young talent here. Um, you know, a lot of players, you know, go on to college and some have gone pro from Davis. But tell me why we're trying to use the field. And they said, oh, yeah, it's going to be 150 an hour. What? I'm like, an 150 hour? an hour? I'm like, do you know how many professional athletes are here that can just highlight, yo, professional athletes, we come to Davis Legacy to train in the off season. This is a facility and a club that highlights the development of young talent and the, all the players that come back come back here to keep that development right that is going to be worth more than three hundred dollars and i feel like a lot of people just think so short term right that's like and like they're going to try to come back with oh well logistics and liabilities Liabilities. it's an unwritten rule like if you get hurt in off season you deal with that on your own right it's not we're not you're not going to sue the facility right so like stuff like that just makes it really difficult to grow the game when you got people penny pinching exactly. and different things like that exactly. sorry that's that's all i got <laughs> nah you're going with that for sure for sure yeah but let, let's get into you know your uh, introduction you know you had a great career at uh, university of louisville shout out to uh, the guys andrew Farrell, paulo de piccolo yeah. paulo de piccolo yeah. you my cousin Adi, you guys, you that's guys have really built something special. Adi, that's my guy too. He told me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we grew up together. Like metal and things. I was like, yeah, that's my guy. Yeah, shout out to Adi. Respect. The soccer world is really small. Uh, so you make it to the league. Um, you know, you have a great rookie year. But what was that moment when you're like, oh, I'm here now? Like, damn, I didn't know it was gonna be like this. Right. Well. It's crazy, like, looking back on, on, like, how my career began, like, it's crazy because everything just kind of happened so fast. To go from IMG to, like, to go from Mississippi to IMG to Louisville and to, like, my second year at Louisville, like, I started getting being involved with, the, like, the U-20s. And the U-20, um, we had a few trips, you know, uh, my sophomore year when I was still in college. And we went to Brazil. We went... Where else do we go? France. We went to the Toulon tournament. So we were just going places. And for me, like, I'm still growing the love for the game at that time. And it was just like everything was starting to happen so fast. Like, I'm, like, in college, but everybody that was on the U20 team mostly, I think, except for Jordan Morris at the time, was uh, was already pro. But for me, I never had this dream of playing pro soccer because I hadn't seen that much growing up. You know, I just know I grew up watching my brother play, and it was like, all right, it's cool. I kind of like this now. You know what I mean? And now being involved with the national team at that time, U20, um, it was like, dang, like maybe maybe I could, you know, make something of this, you know. And at the time, um, Tab Rumble, shout out to Tab, great coach. Um, he was like, look, man, like, you know, you can play. Like, you, you got to be, you know what I mean? You got to believe in yourself as much as I believe in you. And, like, if you want to actually, like, take this further, then – you might, you might want to think about leaving college to go on pro. And I was like, wait, what? You, you think I can make it pro? So for me, it was lit when he said that. I'm like, dang, maybe I can do this for real. You know what I mean? So it was like, all right, go back to school, finish finish my sophomore year, see how that season goes. And then at the end of that season, I started getting contacts from, from agents and stuff. I'm like, hey, like I, for me, it was like everything started happening so fast. Like, wait, maybe I can do this pro thing. Like, maybe it's something that's, that can possibly happen. And then... Um, sure enough, you know, had that opportunity, um, dr- got drafted. Uh, so that moment was crazy. Had my brother and my family there with me. Uh, amazing moment. Something I never thought I would, you know, I would like never, you know, I've been in that moment. Uh, because like I said, just being a pro soccer player was never something that I dreamed of growing up. Um, but yeah, so that happened. And then, uh, yeah, getting drafted to Colorado. Like I said, I was only 19 still. So, you know, just moving out there to a place I had never been before, uh, living on my own, you know, 
for me still being a kid, but in practice every day with 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 grown men. Like you know, I grew up watching Edson Buttle at the time. You know, when I got to Colorado, Edson Buttle was you know on the team still. So for me, I'm like, dang, you know, I'm not trying to be like starstruck, you know. <laughs> But like for me, that was a big, you know, that was a big moment for me. You know I, mean? <laughs> I was like, dang, like I'm actually pro right now. You know what I mean? Shout out to Essen though. Yeah. Um, but yeah, guys like that, and then uh, you know, actually one game, getting get my jersey call. Like, hey, you going in the game? I'm like, wait, what? What did you say? Like, I'm about to go in. And then it's like, dang, like from that moment on, it was like, all right, yeah, like I can do this. You know what I mean? Now let's see how far I can take this. And, yeah, now it's about to go into my ninth season now, and it's, it's, it's been a hell of a journey. No, nah, what a blessing. I think the biggest thing that you said is, like, exposure, like going from those U-20 camps, like, right. out the country and, you know, having a coach that believes in you, too, because that's a big thing. For sure. You know, having a coach that believes in you, uh, that makes all the difference. But, all right, now you're in the league. Uh, yeah, you, you say you're trying to avoid getting starstruck. But what was that moment on the field where you're like, whew, you know, I didn't know this guy was like that. Or how come I keep losing the ball? You know, there's always that moment where it's like, all right, welcome to the big leagues, my guy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I would say, like, as far as, like, having teammates um, in Colorado one year, uh, the year we probably made a, a big run um, was when we, we got Tim Howard and Jermaine Jones. Um, that was pretty pretty big year for us. Um, with Pablo as the coach. And um, I think everybody was just bought in at the time. It's like, all right, look, we're going to go out there and fight every game, like, for 90 minutes. We're going to still been a small-budget te- team at the time in Colorado. We weren't spending, like, big, big money. But, you know, um, everybody was just solely bought into what Pablo wanted. And um, he brought that mentality out of us every game. And, uh, like, I, that was another moment where I was like, all right, I'm – watching these guys play for the national team, me being with the U-20s and U-23s, uh, you know, it was like, at that time, it was like, all right, if I'm doing this and I'm able to do that, like, let me try to push to get into the men's team. And, you know, guys that I was, you know, seeing on TV representing the U.S. and now having them as teammates, for me, that was a big moment in my career. Um, and then to go, to, and I would say as teammates, but as far as players that I played against and, you know, one of the best players I say, like, played against was Javinko for me. Like, he was just, like, different. Like, every game, it was just like, wow. Like, you know what I mean? Able to do things that, I mean, it didn't matter how many defenders was on him. You know, he was just going crazy. And, uh, yeah, it was a big, big moment for me where I was like, all right, yeah, this guy is like that for real. Yo, Giovinco had some comments about the league recently. Um, <clears throat> I think he... I think he said, uh, like, it wasn't real football or something like that. Right. Uh, I think he was in, in reference to Insigne coming over. Right. Um, like, how do you feel about those types of, like, those types of comments when, you know, players say, when players try to downplay MLS, mm-hmm. the level of MLS versus, you know, say, another league? Yeah, I think it's hard, man. I think it's, you know, for him when he came over here, it's not going to be too many guys that come over here and, and succeed, you know, every year like Jeff Inko. Uh, uh, we've seen that in the history with big players coming over here. And, you know, it, it takes time, you know, the travel, um, you know, before, you know, before we're actually having like, you know, com- the commercial flights, like, you know, those are hard. Like those are tough trips, you know, going through airports and all that stuff. Like it's tough. And like, you know, going to Houston in the summer and playing those games aren't easy. Uh, and I think a lot of guys see that when they get over here. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's only a few guys, you know, that are able to come over here and it, it just works out right away. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to be hindsight. You know, he should just ha- be happy he got the bag because. He got the bag. <laughs> yeah. Right. He got, he got the bag. He should be, I think he, most, I think, like you said, I think some of the thing is like the logistics off the field, like dealing with the commercial flights. Right. You know, it's probably some different things when it comes to tactically mm-hmm. understanding of the game. Like, you know, and obviously him being like um, high talent, he's probably getting kicked a lot, which is yeah. wasn't the case when he was playing in Europe. Uh, but yeah, I liked your insights. Um, you've been fortunate enough to play for multiple teams. You know, talk about uh, some of the different things that you learned and then favorite away city. Yeah, I, I, 
gotten a chance to play at, uh, I think this is my Colorado, Houston, this is my fourth team. Uh, for some reason, I, I kind of, I, some, I don't know. I think Houston was probably the warmest city that I, I was able to, like, out of the four teams play in. But for the most part, Colorado was cold. Minnesota was definitely cold. <laughs> and here right now, it's snowing. So I, I'm, I keep getting attracted to these cold, you know, cold places. But, um, yeah, man, it's been cool to be able to play for uh, a few different coaches. I would say uh, my time in Colorado with Pablo for those first couple of years was like he just like prepared you mentally like more than anything that tactics had to do with the game it was just he just made you want to play for him and like his speeches before the game you know and for me at that 19 year old kid that I was being a 19 year old kid that I was at the time he was just like all right now he was basically trying to teach me how to become a man and that had nothing to do with football at all it was just about how can I grow up and be a a good man and was like and I respect him to this day for that um, and also him giving me the opportunity to go out there and play as much as I did um, helped me have this career uh, so far and to go from there to Houston to play for Wilmer um, you know it was a, a time for me where it was a very Hispanic uh, locker room and uh, shout out to that because I, I actually was able to learn a little bit of Spanish while I was down there and being around those guys. And uh, my guy Beasley uh, helped me out with that because he was fluent. And so, like, uh, you know, if I had any questions about tactics or anything in practice from what Wilmer was um, talking, you know, DeMarcus could just talk to me and be like, yo, look, this is what he wants, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that was a cool experience. Uh, and then to go from there to Minnesota, um, Minnesota was super, super cold, like super. I've never experienced no cold like that ever. And it was like me being from Mississippi to end up in Minnesota was like completely op- opposite. Like, uh, but we also had a good run there last year or two years ago. Um, Adrian was more of a coach where uh, he would let you play, like he would let you be free. Um, but at the end of the day, he just wanted to make sure you were fit and you were gonna run your socks off, like you know, English style coaches how they are. Um, and I think that that helped us out the season that we did and um, still pissed about that because conference final on a row in Seattle up to zero and so yeah y'all bottled that we bottled it man we bottled it and it's crazy because we were on we were on like a win streak of like I want to say like 12 games at a time uh, we're, we're unbeaten in the last 12 or 13 games at that time and I just felt like you know it was meant to be and uh, we had just gotten Reynoso, who was, like, tearing the league apart. Um, and, yeah, up 2-0, and we was like, all right, we're going to Columbus. We're going to play Columbus in the final. And, you know, we had everything said. And, yeah, sure enough, like you said, we bottled that, man. And that hunts me to this day. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Like, from that season to come here to Columbus last year, um, when I came here, it was, it was like – to come here as a right back, you know, it wasn't to be a midfielder, you know, even though I, I was a midfielder in college and growing up, I was a midfielder, but I kind of just transitioned to playing on the wing, playing as a fullback. I kind of was just, you know, a utility player um, for a while. And, you know, last year, been able to get the opportunity that I did to play in the midfield with who I think is super underrated. One of the best players that I've ever played with. Your favorite player's favorite player. That's what I like to exactly, say. Exactly, man. Exactly, man. He's a baller, Darlington Nagy. But, yeah, that whole experience um, last year, to be a part of that, um, it was super, super cool. And like I said, to be able to win something here for the city again. And um, But, yeah, we, we definitely we definitely feel like um, we have more to give this year. Um, we're not happy with the way the season ended. Um, so we look forward to right our wrongs this year and see what happens. No, I like what you said, you know, about, you know, your career, because I think a lot of people can take a lot of things away from it. You know, you talked about the early days with Colorado. You have to learn how to be a man. You have to learn how to take care of yourself because right. no one has time to babysit. Right. Uh, you pointed out in Houston, you had to learn Spanish. Right. Uh, that is a key factor as the game grows. It's an international game. So right. any way you can get an advantage, whether it's learning Spanish or you have a better rapport with your teammates, mm-hmm. that's clutch. 
And then, uh, you know, I, I played with Coach Adrian for a short time, but I knew, no, he is big on fitness. Big. That's one way. That's one way to k- take advantage of being on the field and right. having the trust of a player. Thanks. There is one drill. I don't know what type of fitness drill he did, but this <laughs> thing, oh, my goodness. <laughs> that boy is that, crazy. It will be right and up warm up sometimes, too. Like, you walk <laughs> boom, you're straight into it. Like, dang. Straight into it. Yeah. It was like the one with the, like the three line, uh, the three poles, like twenty four yards apart. Yeah, Yo. that's, bro, it's crazy, it's crazy. God, it, it, whenever during the week it could be, at least for us, like it would be Tuesday, but it could also be like a Thursday or something or Friday, yeah. where you're like close to the game. You're like, dang, like this is a bit, <laughs> like, like you said, if you if you was working your socks off, you know, what I mean, you kind of gained this trip yeah. more and more, and he was gonna let you rock on the field for sure. That's true, and he got some good ass like drills. Like you feel like you're getting better with some of his shooting drills. For and sure, yeah, like he, yeah. Him being the forward that he was in his days, definitely like you can yeah. see it. And I trained as we had like some some dope dope finishing drills. And then lastly, you talked about you know being versatile. You know, because there's only so many roster spots with you know, you know, some teams are have big budgets, some teams have small budgets. But if you are able to play multiple positions, you know, GMs are trying to be smart and flexible with their money. Right? Like, all right, we got this guy; he can play right back and center mid. Mm-hmm. You know, some people say it's a curse, like you know, jack right. of all trades. But right. hey, you, you're nine years in the league, that that stands for something. So, for sure. um, I like how you pointed out all these different things. Um, but when you first move to a city, what's the first thing you do? I know for me, I'm finding the closest Nigerian restaurant, <laughs> the closest Caribbean spot, uh-huh. and then like you know, you got to have like a duck off spot where you like a nice little dinner, but wow. you know, you don't want too many people to know about, you know? Right, right. Uh, and a barber too. I can't forget barber, that. Sorry, you got to find sure. a barber. Barber for sure. When I cut the hair, I was like, all right, I gotta find the hottest barber that I can find around. Uh, but also, like you said, just like for me, like location matters. Uh, I want to be like close enough to the training facility, uh, close enough to the stadium. Uh, but also, I still like the the city vibes. Like I'm, I live downtown, so like if I want to be able to walk, I don't have to you know get in the car and drive everywhere. I can just you know, yeah. you know what I mean. So I like that. I enjoy that. But also, like you said finding cool little restaurants where I can go, like, with me not wanting to cook, you know, as often as some people <laughs> may do. But, you know what I mean? So I got to have a, a cool arsenal yeah. restaurant. Yo, yeah, get this man an Uber Eats <laughs> deal, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah, sell me out, yo, sell me out. But, yeah, that definitely matters to me, though, for sure. Vibes, restaurants, the barber. Um, but also, like, you know, during the summer, maybe I could find somewhere on the rooftop where I could just chill out the practice or somewhere that, you know what I mean? Like, during the day, yeah. you know what I mean? I like to people watch, too, so um, I don't like to be, <laughs> okay. yeah, I don't like to be locked up in the house all day, man. So, yeah, I just have to practice sometimes when it's nice out. I just go somewhere, go for a stroll, um, people watch a little bit, but that's usually what I'm doing most of my free time, for real. No, I yeah, love Colum- it. Columbus got a couple of decent rooftops. Yeah, Columbus is cool. My business but partner, I can't have like high expectations for the city. Yeah. Um, because I hadn't been here much, but you know, having come here is like it's a pretty cool city, man. I, I rock with it, and it's what I like the most about it. Um, other than like us getting a new facility, a new stadium, that's all those things are dope. Like having a really good locker room. It's like the the fans like they like they show their support like you know I remember one of the, the games when we got here um, when we opened a new stadium um, they were like marching down the street like to the games and stuff I was like damn for me that was like one of the first time I played somewhere um, that was doing stuff like that um, you know me when I was in Minnesota I got there and I was they had said like season tickets sold out blah 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 but then COVID hit so all the games were like mm-hmm. you know empty so I never got to experience yeah. that uh, and then we did the bubble. So we weren't really in Minnesota long anyway. So coming here, actually having the games pretty sold out every game, having the fans marching, um, you know, our supporters group is really dope. You know, I'm enjoying that. And uh, also there, there's a few like little stores and stuff I want to shop and, you know, um, do those things outside the field. I found a few of those too. So yeah, I'm sorted out. No, yeah, we definitely going to get into that later. But, you know, you talked about your, your time in Columbus and your first time winning the trophy. Uh, you guys, you know, beat Cruz Azul in the Campionas Cup. Uh, talk about that feeling, you know, after being so close with Colorado and Minnesota before. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was like, you know, finally, like it was like, a, <laughs> like, damn, like, 
because it was like the more that you get in those, you know, those, those, op- you get those opportunities. It's like not in, like you start thinking. Of, for me, it was like I start thinking the worst. Like, what's the worst? You know what I mean? It's like, all right, like this, this has to be it. Like, you don't get these many opportunities, you know, That's right. on your career. So it's like let's let's do everything we can to make the most of it. And I could just I got the feeling like before the game, like in the locker room, like everybody was just looking ready. Like nobody was just on their phone. Like everybody just looked super focused, um, and we was like, "Yo, like, what, what do we have to lose? Like, we're going against Kulazu, yeah, blah blah blah." But like, let's win something. Like, let's. You know, it's only one game. It's one game here in our home field. Like, give everything we got, and let's. You know what I mean? Be able to celebrate this after the game. And you know, I didn't think we were going to lose the game um, from the beginning of the game um, before it kicked off. Like, I just felt we were going to win and. Sure enough, we went out there and was able to get it done. And the vibes after the game was like, it's like what you expect, you know, when you win something, like, you know, smiles and dancing and music going on and champagne bottles. It was just like, yeah. hey, this is what it feels like to be a champion. Um, you know, I got I got a little taste of that. Uh, I'd imagine that's a great feeling after the Minnesota. You guys probably had, like, you know how you put the drapes up to cover for the champagne? Y'all had it ready, and then y'all lost. So they had to pick the down. It was like, damn. Now it's Columbus. You know what I mean? It was like, and then in Minnesota, like, in Seattle, like, you already know how hard it is to win in Seattle. Like, Uh barely do you go up 2-0 against a team like Seattle in Seattle. And you know what I mean? So it's like, you have to, like, you have to pull that off, and you know, in Colorado when we made that run, we lost to Seattle, and they hosted the uh, they they hoisted the trophy on our on our field. So in Colorado, so it's like damn. Uh, so it's like you know what I mean. All right, this is maybe this can be payback. And so being with Minnesota when we went to Seattle, I said like, all right, let's you know what I mean. Let's be able to do that here, and they came back and, and beat us. It was like all right, man, like that sucked, but. Uh, yeah, so to, to actually win something yesterday, uh, last year with Columbus was was a it was a huge, a huge, huge, huge high. No, nah, it's, it's it's definitely huge, especially how you talked about you know, those those chances come few and far between as you get you know deeper into your career. So uh, for that to happen almost like immediately after, especially in your first year with the new franchise, not a new franchise, but a, your new club, right, uh, is amazing. How do you feel uh, MLS stacks up against Liga MX? Like, you think like we finally going to get to over that hump of like winning uh, CONCACAF Champions League, you know, consistently win Campionas Cups, you know, different things like that? I would like to say so, man. It's, it's tough, like, doing Champions League over here. Is, you know, the time of the season, us coming, you know, from the off season and starting preseason, and we're right into big games like that, you know, when their season is already going on. So I think that timing is just, you know, it's a little bit tougher uh, for MLS teams. But I think, like, you're starting to see a lot of MLS teams being able to compete with, you know, top teams in Mexico. And uh, that's a testament to, um, you know, that the coaches, that the, the league is starting to, you know, starting to incorporate here and the players that are starting to, you know, come to, come over here and play. So I think for sure. And also with the national team, man, like, you know, right now it just seems like we have Mexico's number, man. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, because we definitely have some, some, some nice young, some nice young talent right here, and uh, I'm curious to see how you know 22 works out for us this year. No, you're exactly right. I think it's a combination of you know, obviously tactics has you know definitely evolved as we've gotten you know older and developed, but also you know investments, you know international talent, getting some guys like Zellerine uh, on your squad, like people like that, uh, but also like I feel like a, there's a quiet confidence with some of the new generation of American-based players. It's like, yeah, I mean, you play in Mexico, you play in Europe. I mean, I play here, right. and we are on the same field, so show me what you got. Right. And I think that mentality is like has really helped us, whereas before it's like, oh, that guy, that guy was playing in Champions League. Yeah. Right. Nah, not anymore. <laughs> right. Not anymore, yeah. We passed those times for sure. For sure. Yeah, so what advice would you have for a young player? I mean, you've kind of done – like you've hit all the ceilings you can hit, you know, right. came, came out of a small city, right. top school, top prep school, right. you know, started playing quality minutes your rookie year <laughs> over uh, eight years in the league. You know, what advice would you have for a young player trying to, trying to get where you at? 
Um, for me, it's just about belief, man. Belief in yourself. Like, like I said, for me growing up, it was, you know, I wanted to play soccer. Uh, I wanted to be able to get into a school so my family wouldn't have to worry about, you know, tuition. Uh, but after, you know, being able to go through that and seeing how far I could take it, it's like, okay, like, believe in yourself and know that, you know, that anything is possible. Um, no matter where you're from, no matter your circumstances, um, no matter um, what you might, the, the lack of what you might have. Um, because there would be times where I would go to practice and maybe we chasing the same ball when it goes out of bounds because we only have one ball at practice. You know what I mean? It's little things like that. Like We didn't have the most, but it was all we needed. Uh, and, you know, for me, uh, I just hope that, you know, my story can impact a lot of kids from where I'm from uh, or from areas, you know, similar to that. Uh, you know, like, yeah, just believe in yourself, regardless of it's soccer or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, I, I think that that'll take you, you know, further than you think you can. No, I love that, man. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's jump into some, some fun stuff. Um, I was scrolling through your IG, and your sneaker game is on point. So... <laughs> <laughs> like, do you have a favorite pair or like a favorite silhouette that you're rocking, you know, lately? That you yeah, find yourself coming yeah, back to? I, it helps when your brother's a plug. It, you helps, got... it helps. It <laughs> helps. When he had the Nike gig, I was, man, I was plugged in for a while. Uh, but yeah, man, we both we both grew up, you know, uh, collecting sneakers our whole life. And my only job that I've ever worked um, outside of soccer was I was a referee, like, but that's obviously still a, like a part of soccer. But I would referee like youth games growing up. Uh, but that money that I would make on the weekends would go strictly to sneakers, like. And so you know that's that's how I was growing up until I was about like 16, 17. Um, just go referee a tournament, maybe make three hundred dollars, two fifty in a weekend, and just use that for sneakers, man. That was that's how I was growing up. And my my family was like, look, you want it, work, go work for it. You know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yo, so that's what I was doing. You know, that was my hustle growing up. And then, um, yeah, but I say right now, uh, Jordans for sure. Obviously, uh, Jordan 1s. I like Jordan 1s. They're probably like super, super my uh, most comfortable sneaker. Uh, but mm. I also just like Air Force 1s, like a good pair of Air Force 1s, too. And I can just go wherever I want in those. Um, you could do you could do a lot with them. Um, yeah, versatile. Yeah. So where, where are you ranking your sneaker game? You know, across the league. You know, I I, I got you and Z Zarek in my top five. But uh, where are you ranking I, yourself? I heard Zarek's got some heat. I heard Zarek's got some heat. Uh, uh, but I, I think I'm up there, man. Like I haven't seen too many <laughs> locker rooms uh, with guys that uh, that try to like you know show up on game days and you know put things together. Uh, that's kind of what I enjoy about being here in Columbus, too, because I played for a few teams where, you know, maybe we had to wear a suit. When I was in Minnesota, we had to wear suits uh, that they gave us every game, yeah. um, which was like, even in the summer, it's like hot, but you got to wear the suit. You know, yeah. right? And then in Colorado, when we had Hudson, he had us wearing our track suits. Like, you know what I mean? So it was like, that's no, boring. It was boring. It was like, you know, let me express myself. This is a way that I can express myself before the game. Like I said, if I look good, then I'm, you know what I mean? I feel good. And oh. you know, like, yeah, man, I like to be able to, like, you know, put clothes on uh, for a game and actually try to get fresh. So, but I think I'm up there. I like, I like a few guys that come off top. Like, I see Kellen's doing his thing, Kellen Acosta. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, but, Kelly coming for the crown yeah, when it comes to the fashion crown, stuff. Coming, but he does a lot more than I do. Like, I'll give him that. With, yeah. um, he does a lot more with the suits and uh, things of that nature. Um, but as far as, like, straight, like, streetwear and things like that, I'm definitely up there for sure. For sure. Respect. Yeah. Anyone that says they're up there without saying a number, that means they think, hey, I'm top two, not two. <laughs> you know? <Right. laughs> He's just trying to be humble about it. I feel it. Right. I feel it. You used to have, like, a little competition over here in Columbus, too. Was a, we had some guys that would, you know what I mean, pull up to the games and be like, hey, okay. Yeah. Uh, so we kind of make it a little, you know what I mean? Let's see. Let's hey, see. Must be nice to have money, huh? Nah, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> 
but yeah, man. So like, that's just fun for me outside of like the game itself, and just yeah, just like trying to get fresh and uh, whether it's going out for you know uh, dinner or something, like whatever it might be, just like actually like to look good and you know, like I said, that matters a lot. But how I feel and how I play in the game. No, nah, if you can only wear one pair of kicks forever, like one like one style, one colorway, one pair of kicks forever, yeah. what would it be? Dang, that's a good question. <laughs> one style. I say lately, I've been rocking a lot of dunks lately, man. Uh, it's funny because growing up, like my brother always was collecting dunks anyway. Uh, but like yeah. the SBs, like the fat tongues, like the skate, yeah. you know what I mean? So I was yeah. like, yo, why are you wearing those? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, just for me, those are like the knockoff Air Force Ones growing up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's how I viewed them growing up. But now, like, seeing them come back out, and I'm like, dang, like, those are actually dope. Like, you were ahead of the game. So I, I give my brother, like, big credit on stuff like that when it comes to sneakers and fashion. Like, he just had an eye for it, like, his whole life. And, uh, but yeah, like I'm on a, I'm on a dunks wave tough right now. Um, but if I was to choose a color, I wear a lot of black, so it would probably be something like white and black, or um, okay, maybe something like that, like something that I can you know I can pull a lot off with it. Okay, for sure. Yeah, that um, the SB Dunk era in the mid two thousands, like it's unmatched. It was unmatched. Though. It was unmatched. Super unmatched. Yeah. Um. All right, so. This one might be a little controversial. Like, who has better fashion sense, you or your brother? See, if you ask him, you would have a different answer than me. Because um, <laughs> he, he'll, like, go out on a limb and wear something that I, I won't wear. Like, mm-hmm. um, so I was, for, for me, what I wear is super, super, like, different sometimes because I'm cool with, like, wearing, like, sweatpants and stuff. Um, yeah. But still trying to, like, you know what I mean? Look fresh in the sweatpants. But for yeah. him, he will just do like something like crazy, like he will do something like shorts and tims or something like he will do like crazy stuff that I wouldn't do, like you know what I mean, like yeah. just like random stuff, like he'll do, but he'd be like, dang, that's kind of dope, like. But he's like I said, like with the when people was rocking like the the first Yeezy stuff that was coming out with the holes in it, like Mo was on that already, mm-hmm. like before, like he was doing that. So it's crazy, like some stuff that I've seen like come out now. Like, I was seeing him do that years and years ago, but it's just crazy, like, how he even had that vision. Like, you know, why yeah. you even think of that? You know what I mean? Like, you know, certain clothes, like, I'll see him, like, creating certain stuff on his computer. And he's like, dang, that's dope. And then you'll see, like, now I'll see people, like, actually wearing that, but it's like, dang, like, my brother just created that, like, years ago. Like, he's been doing mm-hmm. stuff like that, but it just, he just hasn't put it out for the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I definitely, yeah. like, I guess I would have to give it to him. Also. I guess I had to give it to him. Long story short. All right, so respect the elders that love it. Love it. Yeah, respect. But we do things that I do things that he wouldn't do probably, and he definitely does a lot more than I would do for sure. Like that hat is your brother's line, right? Yeah, yeah. So we got the the hats going right now uh, in the city, like snapbacks, truckers. Uh, but we eventually want to, you know, start selling like clothes and, and other types of merch soon. So. That should be coming out soon too. That's a good segue into my next question: Is do you have any off pitch endeavors or hobbies that you that you do when you're not not on the field? Yeah, so this is one of the biggest things that I'm doing outside the field uh, with him. Uh, mm-hmm. So when I was back home in the off season, it was a bunch of that, like you know, hand in hands, like helping send orders out, uh, but also like you know, trying to do stuff where we can take pictures or video shoots and stuff where we can like you know get content. Um, yeah. because you know people want to see it and if you can put in a cool put it in a cool vision where people are like dang that looks pretty dope then it's like it's more pleasing to the eye and now they want to gravitate or, you know, into it so um, yeah so I was I was definitely doing um, that for the for the most of my time outside of soccer um, just helping him with the brand and um, hopefully I, I'm able to do that a little bit more you know uh, this year tell us a little bit more about the brand I mean, my brother like had a had a clothing store in Atlanta a few years ago um, that I'm sure he, he spoke to y'all about. Um, mm-hmm. But like him, just always having this vision, um, whether 
clothes, shoes, whatever it might be. You know, this is stuff that he's already had his life based around. And, you know, I'm just trying to use whatever I can, whatever platform I have to help him, um, you know, fulfill that vision. And, you know, right now uh, I was back home on off season. I went to a few like Jackson State games, um, uh, football games, that is. I was doing like little, we were doing like tailgates and stuff, but I was out there just, you know, trying to get the hats uh, out there for people to see. Uh, and we, we did a few that had, you know, Jackson State logos on them. Um, mm-hmm. And we were able to like try to get some and to Deion Sanders' hand, you know. So guys like that, um, that we think that could grow the brand uh, because obviously the hat with, with the M for Mississippi. Yeah. Um, just try to, you know, grow the brand as much as we can, you know, in the, in the state. Um, but hopefully, you know, the the ultimate goal is to, you know, try to get it for, you know, the world to see on a bigger platform. For sure. That's super dope, super dope. You got yeah, any uh, NIL deals coming coming down the pipeline? You said what? So you got any NIL deals coming down the pipeline? You know, <laughs> some of the college students? Man, look, you know, man, that would be official dope. Official ambassadors? Right. That would be dope for sure. Um I mean, we've reached out to a few guys uh, that, that play locally um, to try to get them in it. Um, but also, there's other guys that's from Mississippi that play uh, in the NFL that we didn't really know mm-hmm. about. Uh, so reach out to the guys like that, guys that, you know, play in the NBA. Um, maybe they don't like two-way contracts between them and G League. Um, but also, I still got a few of my homies that play soccer. Uh, shout out to Marcus Epps. Um, he was in the league for a while, and uh, he's still playing now. I think he just signed in Phoenix, so uh, a, a big move for him. Um, but I try to get guys like that, you know, that I know, uh, who I think would be good in the brand also. Um, mm-hmm. But also, obviously, my brother, he knows way bigger people than I know, and, you know, that I could reach. So, you know, anything that helps. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. dope. That's super dope. Um, super dope. Start from within. Right, for sure. For sure. So jump into a couple of these rapid fires. So like on game days, what's on your pre-match playlist? Ooh, my top two artists would probably be on game day would be like Gunna and uh, I'll probably do Gunna and Lil Baby. Okay. Who control the ox in the locker room? You? Yeah, I'm on the ox for sure. I'm on okay, the- okay. Lil Baby. Uh, Derek, my, my guy Derek Etienne will be on there too, but... Okay, I can see yeah, that. Yeah, I can see yeah. that. He's probably got more of the the all around he got from from rap to he can he can do the he got spanish songs the latin songs he got he got he, him being haitian he can do that if he wants you know but for me i'm more of a i'm more of a rap before a game i want to rap i want something that's going to get me turned up you know what i mean in a different way yeah. so i'm on that for sure but um other than that i kind of like i do a little r&b too though for a different vibe yeah okay, okay. Favorite away city to visit? Oh, favorite away city. Man, I was in Portland for that finals, man. That was crazy. Like, to to play in, I would say Portland has, like, one of the dopest, like, stadiums, environment, whatever that might be. Um, when you walk into the game, <laughs> before, an hour before the game, the fans are already there singing about, but I think that's dope, like, Moby, I, I, I bet that was pretty dope for you to be out there, like, witnessing that in person, like. Bro, yeah, to play for them for, like, two years, I, it was a pleasant surprise, and, uh, yeah, Portland's a great city. I already know, like, yeah. that was crazy, like, it must have been, like, super, super lit when you're out there, but um, I would say, like, that's probably between them and Atlanta for, like, uh, stadiums and stuff, atmosphere, uh, but just, like, traveling city, like, to go like, man, I, Toronto for me, Toronto is, man, come on, Toronto is great. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's the, you got to get on, you got to get on our Patreon to find out why Toronto's, you know, one of the best away cities. Our imaginary Patreon. <laughs> uh, yeah, All right. I got to check out, yeah, we got a trip out there this year, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and another one we like to ask is, who's on your five-a-side? If you had to do a five-a-side team, who would be on your squad? Like, with players that I play with or against or what? However you want to do it. 
However you want to do it. Y'all playing pickup in, in Mississippi. You guys got to hop the fence. Who are you picking on your five to run the on, to run the course? Dang. That's a good question. Because obviously, I just like, you know I mean? I want to do the Messi's and the Ronaldo's, but I'm going to use people that I know and that I, like, grew up playing with. And what people, like, would, would be, like, surprised to see, like, this five-a-side for Mississippi will probably be, like, competitive, like, in a big, 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 like, five-a-side tournament, like, for real. Like, we actually had some, you know, some ballers. Um, but, like, guys that I actually played with would would be my dog, Marcus Epps. Uh, I got to gotta have my brother in the squad. Um, we had one guy um, that, that was playing also on my team growing up a little bit, um, but he was probably one of the first people that I knew that was playing uh, pro soccer outside of Justin Mount from Mississippi. His name's Kellen Gully. Guy's a baller. Yeah. My, he's a baller. Um, so those three. Um, uh, two more would probably be guys that I played with would be, I got to throw Nagby in there. And, oh, I guess I need a, a goalie maybe, right? Maybe, maybe we don't even need a goalie now. We're not doing no goalies. Oh, uh, yeah, that's five aside. We don't really, we goalies can't. Okay. Yeah, really goalies. Uh, who else could I put in there, man? I probably throw my boy. I probably put Baji in there. That's my dog, man. Baji's my dog. For real. Okay. We had some, we had some good years together in Colorado. Um, so, yeah, like you said, like, I try to keep it with them, man. Guys that I know, guys that I rock with. Respect. So you coaching or you? you yeah, play? I'm coaching. I, like, I, I'm watching from okay. the side this time. I'm letting them do that thing for sure. <laughs> right, That's right. amazing. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into um, one of our favorite segments of the show, um, formerly known as No Car, Yellow Car, Red Car, and now we're calling it Trending Topics. So this is a uh, rapid fire segment of the show where I'll read off some news headlines, some trending topics, if you will. Okay. Um, and our guests, Marlon, as well as Amobi, will give their opinions on these topics using the soccer car system. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Um, so quick rules, if you're not familiar, no card is, you know, I'm cool with it. I, you know, I agree. Um, yellow card is I can go either way. Or I'm, I'm indifferent. You know, you know, it don't matter. And red card is, you know, I disagree or I'm not cool with it. You know, foul, obviously. And then you give a quick explanation of why you gave it that card. All right, got it? Gotcha, gotcha. All right, first up, <clears throat> former U.S. Soccer uh, Federation President Carlos Cordero is looking to make another run at the seat in the upcoming election, um, to the chagrin of many, obviously. Um, he even put out a, a campaign manifesto called Carlos Vision 2026. So what card are we giving Carlos for his attempt at you know re-election to U.S. Soccer? How many times can you hold that position? Is there like a certain amount of times you can you, you can run for that? I don't know. That's crazy. I don't really know too much about that. For me, that's no card. Let him do his thing. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go yellow card. I mean, yeah, you have the right to run, but I mean, you give it to the new guard. That's what's that's what's wrong with you know U.S. soccer. People try to hold on to these positions for mm-hmm. way too long, and there's not enough change. So um, obviously, you don't want change too much, but Nah, he. I mean, he had his run. He didn't really change much. So that's real. I think, I think um, the big uproar about it was the fact that he ruined U.S. soccer previously. <laughs> so uh, you know, he he was the outgoing president before. You know, you know all these issues happened under his control, uh, and now he's trying to come back. Yeah, so might I change my, that was probably might change my stance. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I'm about to do a yellow card for that too. At least uh, sometimes you can't run it. Sometimes it's not good to run it back. You right? Know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Definitely, you're right. All right. Uh, next up, uh, New York Times is buying the Athletic for 550 million, bailing out the subscription publication who, who was running on uh, empty in terms of operating capital. So, what card are we giving this move? Mm. Mm. 
that's tough. What you got, bro? What you think? Business. Uh, so it's like a two-sided thing. It's, you know, it's like when, you know, two sides are getting a little tussle. It's like, do you get both yellow cards? You get one, no card? You know, how do you figure it out? But uh, for New York Times, I think it's a good situation. I think they probably could have negotiated at a lower price because of the way Athletic was running. They were running on low, uh, easy to, like, kind of have that leverage. But they do want to up their subscribers. Uh, for the Athletic, I mean, you got to get the payday. Um Hopefully they don't change like their whole model of no ads and you know all that stuff. But uh, shout out to some of the people we know um, that were previously or are currently with that the athletic. Mm. Hopefully they get paid out, you know, as part of this deal. Um, so I'll give I'll give a yellow card to both sides. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like the yellow. Yeah. I like the way you broke that down. Yeah. I, I be seeing a lot of reports on on um, Twitter and stuff like you know for soccer and stuff. Um, yeah. Like the athletic, and I try to read it, but every time I scroll down a little too far, it's like I gotta pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, damn, MLS, you can't work out an yeah, agreement. Like on. we should be able to read about ourselves. Right. But yeah, I, I agree with the yellow card. They did have a little sale going on for Christmas holidays, like a dollar for for hour long. Yeah. So I like that. So yeah. <laughs> a, a, a dollar till you forget. Then it's like, oh yeah, uh, you forgot. It's twelve dollars now. <laughs> right. It's only, it's only fifty a year. <laughs> Y'all got it. Y'all got it. All right. <laughs> Last one. A joint investment group um, between Smith Entertainment Group, who owns the Utah Jazz, and uh, David Blitzer, who owns the 76ers and New, New Jersey Devils, has agreed to purchase the Real Salt Lake um, and the rights to um, Utah Royals for around $400 million. Um, another little nice tidbit in here is Dwayne Wade is also listed as one of the members of the ownership consortium. So what card are we giving this deal? for this group purchasing RSL and the rights to uh, Utah Royals. I just saw that, man. That's dope. I, I think that's pretty dope. Uh, I think uh, we're starting to see like a, a, a bunch of uh, athletes from other sports getting involved with the, you know, the soccer market um, mm -hmm. with, you know, K KD and, you know, James Hart. Uh, Steve Nash, guys like that, you know, happy way, you know, being involved. Now I think that's a big look, man. You know, not just for the MLS, but you know, for RSL. And um, you know, I saw some of the stuff that was coming out from the last owner, and that was, you know, I mean, that was, that was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you said it in the nicest way yeah, possible. Yeah, the nicest way. It's like, come on, you know, like that was crazy. Like, yeah, nah. So I, I, I like this one. no card for me. Okay. Yeah, uh, no car for sure. I mean, you know, the Blitzer Group, they have a lot of experience in the sports uh, private equity ownership space. Uh, the only thing is that they probably could have leveraged it because MLS is the one that looks bad if there's no other. So I don't know why they pay 400 mil, but I think probably because of all the outstanding assets that are involved with Salt Lake. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I kind of knew about this deal a while back. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's smart on all accounts, and the fact that Dwayne Wade's evolved, uh, he's getting into his like investment bag. He, he got some good, he got some good partners. That that boy from uh, Qualtrics, uh, so it's good to see. And I want to see how he's incorporated into uh, what they're doing with uh, Salt Lake and uh, the Royals and Monarchs and just the whole ecosystem. Yeah, right. he got a piece of the Jazz now, a piece of Ray Lake. Oh, that's the Jazz too. Yeah, he and his uh, his he and his Mahomes bag a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> You know? For real, for real. Yeah, uh, that's so. it for uh, trending topics for this week. What you got, Mogi? Yeah. No, that's it. Uh, Marlon, thank you so much. Uh, we know preseason is right around the corner. We're wishing you the best of luck as you head into your ninth season. I already said, if I don't know how many people are uh, betting or betters, over, under, six assists. I said five earlier, but I think six <laughs> for Marlon. He's going over that. So if you need to go to Vegas and do like a parlay or something, yeah. plus six assists for Marlon Harrison <laughs> this year, I'm calling it uh, plus 18 starts for sure. Uh, I think you're going to have a good year, continue to blossom in your role. Uh, but for the folks that want to follow you, you know, follow your brand, follow you as, you know, uh, an athlete and, you know, where can they find you? Yeah, man, I appreciate y'all for having me on the show, man. It's dope. Like I said, uh, I, I try to watch as much as I can. Um, I've been on the field, competed a few times together, but... Uh, <laughs> it's too fast. I always try to tackle this guy. It's too fast. <laughs> he's a baller. You know, he's a baller, you know, for sure. Uh, 
<laughs> but nah, man. Uh, yeah, I, I try, like I said, I try to watch as much as I can. And, uh, I'm happy y'all do, y'all got a good thing on y'all hand and y'all doing your thing, man. So that's dope. Uh, everybody out there, uh, you follow me. Uh, Twitter, MarleyG94. Uh, Instagram, underscore MarleyG94. So um, get at me. Talk about anything. Uh, I try to like... Um, have conversations with fans. I try to do like little um, giveaways when I can, whether it's jerseys or cleats or whatever, little stuff like that. Um, but I'm all for like, you know, engagement. Uh, and because I'm still learning about a lot. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that know a lot more than I know. So um, I just like having discussion and talking about anything. So good at me. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Make sure you reach out to Marley if you're trying to. Uh, sorry, I called you by your, your nickname. <laughs> yeah, that's straight. Make sure you reach out. I actually go by Marley. That's crazy. Yeah, everybody calls me Marley anyway. So, yeah, straight. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, make sure you reach out to Marley. We're going to have his socials in the show notes. Uh, we're going to have his, you know, his brand if you guys are trying to catch some merch uh, in the show notes as well. Uh, but that's our show for this week. Uh, subscribe, rate, and review. It helps us get discovered. Follow us on the socials at Two Cents FC. Check out our merch too at Two Cents Sports Shop. It is still cozy season, as you said. Columbus is snowing. It's cold out here in Cali. It's cold out in Atlanta. Uh, so get some merch. And if you enjoy the show, uh, consider dropping a donation in the link in the description. It helps support the cost of the show. Uh, you know, we're not all big time like like, like Marley, um, but for us to be able to get some guests like him, uh, it, it, it all helps. Um, and then tweet us your comments on the show and any topics you want me or L to discuss. Uh, 2022 is going to be a big year. Uh, many blessings to you uh, and many blessings to what we were building uh, with Two Cents FC. I appreciate that, man. Thanks for the time. Nah, thank right, you. All right, happy new year, y'all. All the best.